Everyone, thanks for joining us for this event on the state of European carbon removal policy. The European policy landscape surrounding CDR is shifting rapidly with developments at both the EU and national levels. Open Air is excited to host Sebastian Manhart of Carbon Future to discuss his analysis of carbon removal targets and policies at the national level across Europe, including a discussion of best practices and opportunities, developments and key open questions for the European Carbon Removal Certification Framework, or CRCF, the future of the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, EU ETS, and what that means for CDR. Um, and so we'll get into that very shortly. Before we do, I just want to turn this over to uh, Open Air's founder, Chris Neidl, who's going to talk a little bit about some other things going on in European CDR. Great. Thanks so much, Mega. Pleasure to be here. I'll be quick. Of course, my dog starts to bark as soon as I go on. Uh, but just wanted to uh, flag a couple of relevant things here, uh, given the subject of today's discussion. Uh, those of you who are already in the open air community uh, are aware that we do a lot of uh, advocacy. We advance CDR policies at the national, subnational, and even municipal level. And we have a lot of active groups already in the EU and Europe more broadly. Uh, some of them uh, shown here on the map in Germany, Luxembourg, um, France, Spain, uh, the Republic of Ireland, and then also in, uh, in the UK. Um, so I'm going to post, as soon as I get a free hand, I'll post some links if folks are interested in potentially finding out more about that and joining. But I'm also going to post some links to some very recent content. Uh, just yesterday and today, uh, we held um, some CDR workshops uh, focused on national opportunities in both Spain and Germany, in Spanish and German, uh, yesterday and today. So I'll drop the links for that. And then one that I want to just interest uh, our audience in today is next week, we have a live bill in Luxembourg called the Luxembourg Negative Emissions Tariff, or LNET, and we wrote a, a thought piece on why Luxembourg uh, has surprisingly some really interesting conditions that, that really could position it to be a real leader in CDR. Uh, this will be in English, and we will be um, really invite a global audience to this, particularly folks in the CDR startup uh, community. And so that will be next Thursday, a week from today. Uh, I'll share the link for that as well as the essay that we wrote, and hopefully folks will uh, will come and attend. So that's all as I have, uh, Meg. I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so for the run of show today, Sebastian will give a short presentation, and then we'll have a few prepared questions that I will go through, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. So as you think of things throughout the presentation, um, just go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box. Um, if you can find that one, it's better than putting it in the chat box. It just helps us to separate things out. So please try to find the one labeled Q&A. Um, and onto our presenter. So Sebastian is a climate advocate, leveraging his skills and experiences to support policymakers in making better decisions for our planet. He's a senior policy advisor of Carbon Future, the world's leading platform for high quality carbon dioxide or removal um, accounting, or accounting for over a quarter of all deliveries of high durability CDR in 2022. He's a Cambridge and Harvard trained economist, and he spent a decade as a tech entrepreneur, as well as advised Angela Merkel's chancellery, as well as the World Bank. So Seb, whenever you're ready, uh, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much for having me, Mega, and uh, Chris for the introduction and the yeah, amazing all the initiatives that are happening across Europe. Obviously very keen to, to stay involved and engaged on those. Um, so for today, for this deep dive in Europe, I thought that before we go into kind of questions, I'd lay out the lay of the land um, and kind of pick everyone up, even if you've never heard of European climate policy. So for those who are already deep down in the weeds, apologies if the first couple of minutes might be a bit repetitive for you, but it's always helpful, I think, to make sure everyone's on the same page. So let's start really high level. Um, Europe has a goal of being uh, net neutral. Uh, climate neutral, I mean, we can get into that discussion, um, but essentially net zero by 2050. And that is what really drives the agenda. So we've got the net zero by 2050 goal. And when I say Europe, have think of the EU, it's 27 member states as setting the, the bottom line, the lowest common denominator for all the states. They can go above it, but they can't go below. So we've got the 2050 goal. And then we have three big pieces of European policy. We've got the EU ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme, which essentially regulates at the moment the really heavy emitting industry. So we're talking about power generation, heat generation, oil refineries, uh, steel production, iron production. That's the EU ETS. It's the biggest compliance market in the world uh, where these emitters essentially buy allowances. Um, and we're going to talk about the ETS later, but that's the first building block. 
The second one is the Emission Sharing Regulation, or ESR, which essentially regulates all the other sectors, right? So it's transportation, it's buildings, it's waste, it's agriculture. And that's much more up to the member states of how to regulate it. It's not consistent, as rigid and structured as the ETS, but that's another key building block. And in the future, more of these sectors are going to move to the ETS. So that's also important to know. And the third building block is the land use, uh, land use change and forestry or LULUCF sector, which essentially deals with all managed lands in Europe. Together, this is a very exhaustive kind of, it covers all of the, all of European economy. So we have this 2050 goal. We've got these three key building blocks, but there's a key piece missing, which is carbon removal, which is why we're here today. And we had these building blocks before we realized the carbon removal was essentially essential for net zero. So what has to happen now is to almost retrofit these three building blocks and put CDR into it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, today, CDR is not really as present in Europe at, at the policy level. We've got uh, a target for 2030 for LULUCF of 310 megatons, but that's just managed lands. We've got a non-binding target of industrial carbon removal of five megatons by 2030. And probably most interesting, um, also we've got a goal for 2030, now binding, of 50 megatons of storage in Europe. But that's all that we have in, ter in terms of facts. Um, and right now, there's a call for input for the 2040 targets. This is going to be really important. And uh, the call for input is open. Anyone can participate. All of you can submit something. Um, until June. And that's essentially when we're going to set the CDR, hopefully, dedicated CDR targets for 2040. Now, next, I want to move into the key building block that's missing to get CDR into these different bits and pieces, which is the CRCF, which was already mentioned, the Carbon Removal Certification Framework. If there's one piece of legislation that you follow in Europe, it's the CRCF, if you're interested in CDR. And the CRCF, at the broadest level, is going to try to certify what carbon removal is and what high quality carbon removal is. And think of it as a building block that can then be slotted into these different pieces of regulation. Um, it has three categories, uh, which again, up for debate, we can talk about them, but that's what we're working with. Carbon farming. So this is soil carbon, afforestation, reforestation, carbon products, short lived and long lived, and permanent carbon removal which is obviously kind of the, the golden ticket, the, 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 the category that everyone tries to be in because that's what's going to be certified as highest value. Um, this proposal has been released. We can talk about the mechanics of European policy, but has been released by the Commission last November. It's now at the European Parliament and the European Council. Again, happy to talk about what these all mean later. All you need to know is it's currently in the works. Now is the time to follow it, maybe to engage with it. And um, we know that uh, they're going to try to pass it by Q1 2024. That's kind of the goal before the European election in April next year. Um, but once we have the CRCF, it's the first piece of legislation globally that will essentially define what high quality carbon removal is, which is super exciting, and will then be slotted into the different pieces of legislation. Final thing I quickly wanted to present is... Um, at Carbon Future, we've done quite a lot of work on, um, let me just open this up, just one slide here. We've done quite a bit of work on what European countries are individually doing. And I wanted to give you a quick snapshot, essentially. So we did the 27 EU member states, plus we looked at four non-EU member states, but very important countries, so Iceland, Norway, United Kingdom, and Switzerland. And um, what you can see here, um, is, is super interesting. So first takeaway is uh, Scandinavia is really leading the way. So Scandinavia, they both have more ambitious goals. So Finland 2035, Sweden 2045, Denmark 2045. They've got dedicated um, carbon removal targets in many cases. Denmark even went as far as having a dedicated biochar carbon removal target of two megatons by 2030, for example. But we really see them uh, leading the way. Sweden has a, um, a, re a reverse auction scheme for BEX from 2030. They've invested over 3 billion euros over a 15-year period into a reverse auction scheme for BEX. So we're, we're really seeing some fascinating work being done in Scandinavia, and they really deserve a shout out. And um, Portugal is interesting. 
they uh, have they, they don't have a very well developed general CDI industry. For example, I posted on it today if people are interested. But they have a hard ten percent CDR target for 2050. So it's one of the few countries with a I think the only in Europe with a codified CDR target for 2050. Um, what you can also see here is Eastern Europe uh, and um, the Baltics are quite behind when it comes to CDR at the moment. The big countries, uh, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, also not where I would hope they could be. Germany is a bit of an exception here. They are really opening up now. Six months ago, this would have been a different conversation. But today we've seen a lot of positive change and uh, they could soon turn green on this map. Fingers crossed. They've got a dedicated CDR strategy that will be released next year. They're going to create dedicated CDR goals for 2035, 2014, 2045. So a lot of good momentum there. But yeah, this is just a quick snapshot. Happy to take questions later on any of the specifics, but I thought I'd give you the, the high level overview plus a little bit some of the nuances in the different member states. So yeah, over back over to you. Perfect. Thanks. That was a great overview. Um, someone asked, so I just wanted to uh, say this in case I didn't already, we will have the recording up. Um, I think it gets sent out if you registered and it should also be on Open Air's website and YouTube channels. So you should be able to access that uh, in a couple of days. Um, if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. I'm going to start with a few prepared ones that we um, at Open Air were interested in. So the first one I just wanted to ask was, what's your feeling about, um, you know, how well do policymakers actually understand CDR versus CCS versus offsets? You know, do people really kind of get it or is there still a lot of confusion going on? I mean, the short answer is not really. Um, and that's unfortunately something that we see as soon as we move outside of our CDR bubble, um, it's there's a lot of education work to be done. This is not helped by, frankly, the constant deliberate and non-deliberate reinforcement of this uh, by media. Um, I see this over and over again. Often, as I said, without any bad intention, sometimes it's a bit more dogmatic, but we, it, it doesn't help. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of confusion. Um, we also see it in targets. Targets where there are targets, they usually, like Switzerland's a good example. They've got amazing, they've got targets for 2035, 2040, 2045, but um, they are always thrown together. It's like, yeah, it can be CCUS, it can be CDR. So we see a lot of mixing up. Um, we're seeing the term carbon management emerge more at the policy level. For example, Germany is developing a carbon management strategy. Um, and so we can see more and more that um, there's this acknowledgement of that, they, that which is positive in a way because carbon management is the overarching umbrella, right? Um, but it could also lead to more fuzziness at the level below. So um, yeah, a lot more work is needed. And that's also why Open Air Collective is, I think, plays a key role in that education aspect. But um, yeah, we're not where we should be on that one. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's not surprising. Um, what about just, you know, the, the consensus or not consensus on what's actually needed on, in terms of CDR? So obviously not everyone has actually put policies into place or even developed policies that could be put into place. Um, but do people have, you know, the same net zero dates in mind, uh, shared understanding of like reduction versus uh, CDR and how, how those two play into net zero, um, you know, things like that. Do people have a shared understanding or is that still up for debate as well? There's a lot of um, a lot of differences. So we have a 2050 net zero target, right? But that's the lowest common denominator. And um, beyond that, we have probably a handful of countries that have set 2045 targets. I mentioned Scandinavia, like I mean Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and um, you've got Finland with their 2035 target, which on first look looks amazing. But uh, it was pointed out to me that correctly that they have a potentially a bit sketchy accounting system that underlies that target for their uh, LULUCF, for their managed lands. And uh, so th that's also that's a bit in question. Um, what we see as well is um, that some countries set a percentage for CDR if they went so far or carbon management. Some countries set an amount. Um, again, I don't have a strong opinion. I think both can work, but it's quite interesting that you see these two different approaches. When a percentage is chosen, it tends to hover between 5 and 15% of emissions, which is kind of in line with, if we think about, for example, SBTI, 10%, 90% emission reduction. I think 10% also Portugal. It's kind of where what seems to be the, 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 the average. Um, but again, it's currently not aligned. What will be interesting will be the 2040 goals. Just to mention it again, how important that process is. 
Um, the commission will put up forward a proposal um, next year for this. This year is called for input impact assessment. Next year, they are going to release it. Um, because again, that creates a new common denominator that all the states will have to adhere to. Um, and if we can get some CDR goals in there, then we actually have 27 states with a CDR goal, which is really powerful. But yeah, we still need kind of that forcing mechanism to create consistency. Right. Okay. And I mean, kind of thinking about consistency, where in CDR policy do you think it's important or, you know, helpful for the policy to be consistent across jurisdictions, either, you know, to help operators figure out how they want to work or MRV and standards and registries? Um, and then are there areas where it doesn't need to be harmonized or, you know, it's it's kind of okay for things to not be harmonized across the EU? Yeah, Um that's like maybe just pointing out first the problems when we don't harmonize. Like uh, I mentioned Finland's net 2035 goal, right? Like, and how it was pointed out to me that actually that's only because they're using their own accounting. And that's tricky, right? Because we need to keep the trust of the public. And um, if the public here is, you know, net zero by 2035, it kind of has to mean the same for all countries. Um, at least within the EU. And so I think it can erode trust if that's not consistent. So that's one thing. Um, also double counting um, and coming back to the voluntary carbon market, which is the only market today for CDR. I hope we're going to talk about compliance markets, but that's where we are. And that can be problematic too. For example, also Finland, if I recall correctly, um, suggested that any company, it's not law, but just a suggestion that any company uh buying carbon removal in future um should essentially that should go directly towards the accounting of uh finland's uh net zero targets but that creates like in my view in a voluntary carbon market if a company can't count it towards their own net zero commitment they will stop buying why the hell would they buy it if it goes to the accounting of one of the richest countries in the world they're just going to say buy it yourself and um, again i think it's important to create consistency there um the key step for me is we need to start with the goals, which we already spoke about, and we need to start with certification, which is where the CSCF is so important. Because if we have the same criteria for what constitutes carbon removal, and there are various types of carbon removal, and then we combine that with clear goals, then I think you can leave it to the countries on how to do it. Um, but that's the first step. Where we already, and maybe that's the question, kind of what should countries do themselves? Like in Europe, there's a lot of autonomy on how countries pursue and implement policies. Um, we have a it's yeah, it's comparable to a certain extent with the US in that sense, although obviously different areas are regulated federally and by Europe. But um, there's a lot of autonomy in terms of uh, for example, how procurement is done, how much money is actually spent. Um, and it makes sense, right? Like if I think about Scandinavia, they'll probably want to prioritize biomass-based approaches, just as an example. If I think about um Eastern Europe, which is blessed with more renewable energy, they might want to do more DAC. Uh, Italy, more coastline, might want to do more ocean CDR. So I think it's very important that we're not prescriptive in terms of what technologies to adopt, but really focus on the quality uh, and the goals. Um, so I hope that we're going to allow countries to pursue the technologies that make more sense for them. Um, because, yeah, then we have the best shot. Overall, it's going to be a portfolio approach, but probably not at the country level. Yeah, I mean, I think Open Air is always pushing for kind of standards-based CDR approaches as opposed to kind of going in for a particular method or another. Um, other than that, are there areas where you think things need to be really localized or, you know, do these things need to be localized? Does Italy need a different policy to kind of promote the type of CDR that makes sense there? Or, you know, can we just kind of adopt similar policies throughout and just have it sort of apply in each local context? Think we have to tailor it locally it's also the expectation of like the people civil society is very different in each country and um, some countries might push back much harder against certain technologies because of their past experiences especially when it comes biomass is a good example uh, europe has much more compared to the us has much more regulation historically on biomass so it's more accepted than in the us in many ways but still there are some people and some groups that anything biomass related will just not go down well. So we need to kind of, yeah, we need to allow for variation on a country level. Um, and another problem that can occur is with other, I'm thinking outside of climate, but I did quite a bit of work on digitization in Europe. And if you don't centralize certain things, this is a classic European response. You get 27 institutions that do the same thing. Imagine a registry, 
<clears throat> you could end up with 27 registries for CDR where there could just be one in like one central registry. So I think we'll we'll have to watch out for that kind of bureaucratic overkill um, that sometimes happens in Europe. So far, I've heard, for example, on the registry front, the plan is to have one. But again, we're early in the process. So let's see where it yeah. goes. Yeah, it's a tough balance, I guess, between the two. Um, just turning to kind of what countries are doing uh, individually at the moment, we talked a little bit about which countries already have, you know, the most or least advanced policies and are kind of leaders in the space. Are you seeing countries actually learn from one another or copying the leaders? Um, and how do we kind of foster that in a way that shares the best practices to the extent that it makes sense to do so? Today, I don't see enough linkages, to be perfectly honest. I see a lot of isolated approaches. Um, I see some examples of collaboration. For example, Germany has struck deals with the Netherlands and Norway on CO2 storage, um, but that's bilateral um, and very specific. Uh, the, the US, just give a quick shout out also to OAC, because for example, the, the embodied concrete uh, law that was passed in New Jersey, right? Like that's a great example where New Jersey led with heavy input from OAC, and then I think four or five other states are working on passing similar legislation. That's what obviously I'd hope to see. On the other hand, in Europe, because it's going, the EU has more power than I would say the federal level in the US, we do see more happening from the top. Um, one area where we can see a lot of this collaboration in the future and it tends to happen is the EU legislative process itself. Um, so just maybe, and this is a good opportunity to give people a quick overview. Um, we have the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council of Europe, or European Council. Those are the three institutions. The Commission is a bunch of bureaucrats and technocrats that come from all of Europe, but they essentially develop the initial proposal. They kind of uh, do all the technical work. Then you've got the Parliament, which is the only elected body. Um, but there, again, you have representation from, you have MEPs, members of European Parliament, from all nation states. So there's a lot of engagement that happens there, but they don't represent their nation their country, they represent the interests of their party. Where most of this alignment can happen potentially is um, through the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe has a representative from each member state, and they tend to represent the ministry that's most pertinent to the question, for example, Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Environment in this case. And yeah, you have 27 member states there debating a specific issue together. Um, and I think a lot of alignment happens at the European level here as well. Um, but again, I'm sure in the future, we're going to see more leaders and therefore also more followers. Uh, and I'd probably want to shout out just from my personal experience, Germany and, and France. Uh, again, I, I worked in the chan chancellery under Angela Merkel. <clears throat> and my experience was if Germany takes a strong leadership role, it really influences where Europe goes. And I see a lot of potential here because Germany could soon turn into a leader for CDR. And that would be great because we heard about Luxembourg. Amazing. And I really hope that there's gonna it's gonna find emulation. But if Luxembourg really plows ahead, it doesn't mean that Germany is gonna follow. If Germany plows ahead, it might mean that you know other countries, Belgium might follow. And so I put a lot of my hopes on Germany on this one. Okay. Um turning to kind of how the policies are actually set up. So have you started to see any policy that is sort of standards-based, like you mentioned? So focused on things like additionality, permanence you know, those kinds of uh, characteristics rather than actually specifying a technology or a pathway? And what's kind of your, your general thoughts on how that's being approached? Yeah, I think the, the CSCF is a good example here. Um, the CSCF has embedded in it the so-called quality criteria, which is an acronym, which if you see what it actually stands for, makes no sense. But bottom line is it has four criteria, which is quality, additionality, long-term storage, and sustainability. And I think those are really good buckets to embed in a policy, right? That looks at, uh, you know, is it actually doing what it's supposed to do? Is it financially additional? Does it actually lead to permanent storage? Does it have co-benefits? <clears throat> so I think that's a really good approach. But then in reality, if you look at the application of the CSCF or basically how it's currently defined, um, it still picks specific technologies clearly, which are DEX and BEX. Uh, direct action capture and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. It does so because it can rely on historical legislation on point source carbon capture and storage. So it was almost a shortcut for these two technologies. But that's why right now, although it has these great principles embedded in it, 
it does it actually shows a clear technological preference. So one of the things that um, you know we're working on negative emissions platform called Business Council and others are working on is kind of moving the CSCF away from focus on specific technologies and really to a kind of tech neutral principles based approach. Um, uh, but yeah, we because we also see in the US, it's a good example, also, you know, very focused on one technology, direct air capture in most cases. I and many others, I think, believe that to build something really robust from a policy perspective, we need to keep it open and focus on principles because we don't even know what technologies are going to be around in 10 years, right? So um, yeah, that's our focus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last one before I start doing some of the audience one of ones of which we've got quite a few now. Um, how is Carbon Future actually engaging on this to promote strong policy development in the EU? I would say three levels. Um, one is through uh, trade associations. So I already mentioned the Business Council, Negative Emissions Platform, the European Biochar Industry Consortium. Those are all great organizations doing strong advocacy work on the CSCF and other policies. So I'm an active member there and we engage a lot as Carbon Future. <clears throat> the second one is directly. Uh, I'm a big believer in just knocking on doors and having a lot of conversations with a lot of people. In Europe, the good thing is that um, it's pretty public. Like if you want to see who's working on the CSCF at each of the three levels that I said, each of the three institutions, their lists, their online, their email addresses, get in touch. Like it's it's not that hard. It's just a lot of work, um, but there's a lot of direct communication. And the final one is, um, I also believe in the, the power of communication, of social media, of conventional media. And I think it plays a big role in uh, forming opinions and education. And so that I see that as a very powerful advocacy tool that we use as well. Great. Um, all right. I'm going to start on some of these audience questions. Um, I'm, I'll start with a few kind of on different technology pathways and things like that. So the first one is, how do you see things like, um, this person mentioned specifically ocean iron fertilization and uh, limestone-based concrete, but more broadly, I think outside of DAC and BEX, um, how are some of these other technologies being understood and treated in Europe? So if I had to give a ranking right now in Europe, it would probably be BEX, ducks, biochar carbon removal, enhanced rock weathering, and then a big gap, and then ocean alkalinization in terms of kind of more permanent. Above all of that, carbon farming and forests, mm -hmm. um, because there's a huge political drive to support um, nature-based solutions. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, yeah, we see Bex and Ducks is really, it's it's from, a, if I was a politician, I would support it, right? It's easy to measure. It's It's safe. From a political perspective, like it's low risk in terms of reversal. <clears throat> so it's fully understandable why that's always kind of top of the agenda. There's existing legislation for liability. There's a lot of reasons to support tax and backs for a politician or policymaker. Um, but what we also see is Europe is really leading the way on biochar carbon removal, both in terms of equipment manufacturing, but also in terms of volume. Um, if anyone's interested, interested uh, the EBI, European Biochar Institute, um, has a fantastic report on the state of uh, biochar carbon removal in Europe that was released a month ago. I really recommend it. Um, and uh, it enhanced rock weathering, everyone kind of sees the potential of it, but it, it, this is the problem in general with enhanced rock weathering. It doesn't have a voice at the policy level. Uh, it doesn't have an industry association. Um, and so nobody's fighting the ERW corner. Okay. Um, which is a bit of a shame, but I think it has much more potential at the policy level than it currently gets. Honestly, oceans, this is interesting. In the US, oceans get a lot of attention. In Europe, there's some research projects in, in, in Germany, CDR Mare. Um, I know Portugal is doing work on oceans, but at the policy level in Brussels, um, it's it's not really playing a big role today. Okay. And yeah, I mean, you kind of talked about LECLA, the you know, the concrete um legislation in New Jersey and things like that. The person actually asked about like using limestone and concrete. Is there anything like that going on for the building sector in Europe at all? Uh, I'm not an expert on the building sector. In okay. Europe, so unfortunately I'll pass on that one. Okay. Fair enough. Um, turning to DAC, cause you also were saying that that was, you know, one of the top ones that policymakers are pushing for. What are the barriers to actually scaling it? Because, you know, I think you consistently hear it's ahead of the game, but it's not like DAC is taking off to the megaton scale. Is it a policy thing or is it just tech or what in the eu itself i don't think DAC is a particularly good idea i'll come to how we can make it a good idea but today it's not 
we don't have that much renewable energy today. Uh, you know, I, th I think the average was like 25, 30%. Um, obviously, Sweden is like way ahead, but like we don't have that much renewable energy. We don't have storage. And we have laws forbidding the transport of CO2 in many cases. And under and the London Protocol, for example, is, is, is making it really hard to actually transport CO2. So if you look at just the realities today, you would say, okay, this is not the place where DAC is going to scale. Um, however, there's good efforts. So first, there's agreements. I mean, Norway is really trying to establish itself as the place for geological storage of CO2 in the future. And agreements are being struck, as I mentioned, for example, with Germany. Laws are being overturned to be able to transport CO2. Um, and so that there might, and obviously there is a clear trend towards renewables. So in the future, this situation might look different. Um, but yeah, to, it's not, the US makes much more sense, for example. It has so much geological storage, still a problem. I think renewables are still a problem there. But um, yeah, Europe is probably not the most obvious candidate unless it changes some of the laws and has more bilateral agreements. Got it. Okay. And then outside of kind of those things we talked about and, and biochar, which you also mentioned, um, which technologies do you think are actually the most ready to start scaling in the next couple of years? Tech readiness and sort of policy willingness and everything. I focus a lot on in novel industrial higher permanence, whatever you call it, carbon removal. So I'll, I'll talk about that more than uh, the nature-based side. Um, number one on the list for me would be biochar, simply because we have the players, we have the industry, and it's already removing 100,000 tons of CO2 a year today, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you compare it to other industrial removals, yeah. it's actually a multiplier of that. Um, next, just in terms of scalability, for me, it's enhanced rock weathering. Uh, because again, we, we know how to do it. Uh, the rock is available. We could do it tomorrow in many ways. <laughs> Obviously, questions around MRV and all of that and heavy metals, but just in terms of scalability. Uh, Bex. In Europe today, production is zero, right? Like there is no BEX today in Europe. BEX is the first big plant that's going to come online in 2026 in Sweden by Stockholm Exergy. And um, if I remember correctly, that's going to be like 500,000 500, tons uh, of CO2 removed. So um, that, that's huge, right? Like BEX is slow right now, <clears throat> but could really kick in uh, towards 2030 in terms of scale. Um, ducks in terms of scale in Europe, EU, I see it as almost furthest behind in terms of scaling potential for the reasons we mentioned. And you see big players from Europe going abroad to build yeah. their plants, right? They go to Iceland, they go to the US, they're looking at Kenya. They're not really announcing megaton projects in Europe and there's a reason for it. So um, in Europe itself, I think uh, DAX will be the fourth on that list. Yeah, okay. Um, what about, well, actually, uh, you kind of mentioned uh, the MRV side of things and how enhanced rock weathering might have some issues with that. And you mentioned also that Bex and DAX are kind of ahead of the game in terms of, you know, policy support. Do you think part of that is that they have much clearer MRV and sort of are in a closed system? Or is that not really part of the conversation? Honestly, it's just that we've solved MRV and other questions a while ago, right? You put a sensor on a pipeline and you put yeah. a sensor in a geological reservoir. And so because we've done it, like, for example, in Europe, we have the CCS directive from 2005. And it regulates clearly how liquids, uh, sorry, gasified CO2 um, and liquid CO2, how it's governed and especially who, how the government after 20, 30, 50 years <laughs> takes over liability from the operator of a geological reservoir. That's huge because th then we have an answer to the question of who's liable today, tomorrow, and in 100 years for the CO2. That doesn't exist for other CDR methods. So while in the US, I think the reason that DAX has been pushed so hard is very much the history of oil and gas and the influence of oil and gas in Europe. Um, the reason that Jackson Bex has been pushed so much, I don't actually think they play a role oil and gas, but I don't think it's that much. I think it's much more uh, existing regulation and basically the first one that we can deploy in a safe, low risk way. Yeah. Okay. makes sense. Um, we had a couple of questions about CCUS or CCS uh, and how that kind of fits in. So, you know, what, you were sort of saying it's been conflated and the regulations don't necessarily distinguish the two. Can you just talk a little bit about where that fits into the existing and potential future policies that we're getting? Not a CCUS expert, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that up front. Um, but what I can say is that there's a lot of momentum behind it. Uh, there are some <laughs> very strong um, 
coalitions building also at the European level around CCUS. Um, it plays a much bigger role at CDI at the national level. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of industry support. Um, I, it's definitely here to stay in Europe. Uh, and I would say that, um, yeah, a lot of money is going into it, uh, also through the EU Innovation Fund. So, um, yeah, CCS, point source CCS is going to play a big role in Europe. Um, I think the key question is the intersection with CDR and the differentiation with CDR. But yeah, it's going to be yeah. a big part. Okay. Um, just thinking a little bit more about sort of the different levels at, the, at which this uh, these schemes are built. So someone asked, um, basically, you kind of have talked a little bit about the national level and then the EU level, but then there's another step up to the global level, right, with things like the Paris Agreement um, and countries having nationally determined contributions. So are the EU rules kind of very specific to the EU or can that kind of harmonize with global policies as those start to hopefully come into effect? So... It, th th that's been one of the critique of the C CRCF, for example, is that um, it, for example, it didn't follow the the IPCC definitions, uh, but came up with their own. Um, and there, but there have been a lot of demands to make sure that it's aligned <clears throat> as much as possible with international uh, law as well. Um, and more on a member state level, Switzerland is probably the most prominent example of a country that's that's exploring Article 6 seriously. Um, I don't have the exact number, but it can't be more than a dozen, probably less bilateral agreements have been struck to date under Article 6, and I think six or seven were Switzerland. And I know there's one more in the pipeline at least. Um, so Switzerland is really exploring, again, not EU, but Europe, is really exploring. And why are they doing it? Because they've even recognized, this is really interesting, they have a, a, a goal, um, 2030, 2035, 2040, 2045, and they've already recognized that they will have to import, I think, two or three megatons uh, of CDR every year by 2045. So they, they've they gone so far to define their goal and to say, okay, we actually have to import it because we can't do it in Switzerland. Um, and so that that's an interesting one of how kind of that international dimension can play into the, the national planning. Um, but as we all know, <coughs> CDR at the UN level, it's still early days. Um, and yeah, a lot of work, I think, will hopefully be done at COP this year for it. Got it. Yeah. And do you ultimately see carbon removal being sort of enforced at the national level or at the EU level? Like, will it just be folded into the EU ETS or do each country, does each country kind of need to come up with its own regime? What do you see as likely? I think a mix of both, right? Today, it's all voluntary carbon market. But if we think ahead... <laughs> five, probably more, let's say 10 years, 15 years. Um, it could play a role. I mentioned the kind of the European, the ETS, the ESR, and the LULUCF. Those are the three pillars, right? On LULUCF, we already have targets at national level. So I said 310 megatons by 2030, <coughs> but we have targets, how that's broken down by each country. So we already have that. Um, so the question is, how is it going to be in the ETS and the ESR, the emission sharing regulation? And here... There are, the scenario is basically that the, right now we know that Parliament has instructed the Commission to figure out how could CDR look like in the ETS. As a reminder, the ETS is, I think it's 680 billion euros last year. It's massive. So if carbon removal were included there, it would bring a demand side pull that is not comparable to anything we know today or that probably even the voluntary market could ever provide in the next couple of years. <laughs> uh, so that would be huge, especially if the ETS gets expanded to other industries. You could suddenly have thousands of companies in Europe that have to procure millions of tons, if not more, of CDR. It, there's a lot of problems with it too. It has to be completely measurable. There's a big question around how do allowances exist in the same market with removals? They're completely different qualitatively. There could be a really weird incentive if, or with dynamics and suddenly the removals become cheaper than the allowances. Um, so there's a lot of questions there, but that's one avenue. <clears throat> the other avenue is the emission sharing regulation. The benefit there is that national governments have much more autonomy on how they want to do it. It's not as strict, but uh, the sectors that I mentioned that are still in there uh, are going to increasingly move to the ETS anyway. So um, we should really, by 2040, it's going to be all ETS. Um, so we should really be thinking today about how do we integrate it best we can into the EUTS. 
Got it. And do the ESR carbon credits and the sort of ETS talk to one another today? Like, can they sort of, are the credits uh, trade across them or are they two very separate systems? They're very separate systems. Okay. Yeah. Do you see that changing? Or? Uh, as we said, kind of the, the sectors move. More sectors will be covered by the ETS. Okay. <laughs> but also, yeah, the ETS functions very differently. The ETS is a cap and trade system. It has these allowances that will actually run out by 2039. Um, and by that point, the, the assumption is basically you will have to have decarbonized almost fully and all there will be left is hard to abate emissions. And that's where I think it would make a ton of sense to have carbon removal in there. But some 2039 is 16 years from now. So there are obviously a lot of people that would like to get CDR in before that point. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, could you just talk a little bit about like the VCM compliance markets, the CRCF, and how we avoid double counting or can we avoid double counting as there's sort of more different regimes coming in? So a big frustration that a lot of people have with the CRCF, including myself, is that it currently doesn't specify the use <clears throat> of the certification at all. And I was literally in Brussels with the commission work who works on this two days ago and we kept pushing them on kind of you know it will whether you like it or not it will affect the voluntary carbon market because if i'm a buyer especially in europe and i'm seeing that you know permanent removal is defined x or only these technologies are seen as permanent removal in the CSCF, i'm going to start aligning my buying behavior accordingly and so we made it very clear to them, you know, it will have a huge impact on the voluntary carbon market. Wouldn't it be better if you made it explicit and kind of spoke about it? And so we can actually work together on this. But they are very clear. We're not going to talk about the use. We're only going to talk about the certification and then how it's used by the ETS, by the green claims directive that we didn't talk about, by the voluntary carbon market. <laughs> that's for others to decide. So that's kind of where we're left today. But uh, yeah, it will have a, I think it will have a big impact on both compliance and voluntary carbon markets. Got it. Okay. And, you know, just thinking about sort of these cross-border um, potential deals, are you seeing that EU, you know, member states or the EU itself are going to think about purchasing removal credits, which are, which are sort of delivered outside of their borders? You kind of mentioned a couple of things on this point, but is it likely that all of it needs to be kind of delivered within the country for the policy to, to be there to support it? Or are they going to just look to citing things where it makes sense to cite that technology? It's also something that I've been pushing the commission on because, for example, Carbon Future, <coughs> we work with suppliers all around the world. And uh, we'd love to see an opportunity for producers of CDR in places that actually make more sense economically because they have, I don't know, Kenya for DAC, uh, you know, we now get Bolivia for biochar. And um, it can make much more sense to do it there than do it in Europe. And the climate doesn't care if we do it in Kenya, Bolivia, or Germany. Uh, but voters and taxpayers do care. Um, and so we see in Europe, in the US, that uh, wherever taxpayer money is involved, we construct big walls around us. And uh, that's going to happen in Europe too. So the, the current goal is to set climate targets that are to be achieved entirely with certified, hopefully, removal uh, from Europe. Doesn't mean that some countries might not explore Article 6 to meet their, their goals, but the plan is currently to be Europe-focused. Yeah, I guess on a related point, thinking about sort of the use of, of taxpayer funds to uh, do some of these things, I know the US has kind of put into a place a lot of different incentives, tax credits, grant schemes, and things for companies actually doing the CDR. Are you starting to see any of that in the EU? So, you know, things like non-dilutive funding availability, grants, procurement vehicles, tax credits that can actually spur on the supply side of this as well. So the US is much better at the carrots than the Europeans, and we like a stick. Um, so in in Europe, we don't really do tax credits as much. <clears throat> There's some things that I mentioned, right? There's a reverse auction scheme um, in Sweden for BEX. Um, Norway is different, but they are doing one for tax. And um, there are some, then we have the EU Innovation Fund, which is actually, this is super super interesting uh, because the, that it's financed by the ETS. <clears throat> and so that's billions and billions a year that are going into the green transition and are almost redistributed from polluting companies to the green transition. I think it's brilliant. 
but everyone wants a slice of the innovation fund. Um, Stockholm Exergy, biggest BEX company in Europe, received millions, hundreds of millions uh, from uh, the innovation fund. And um, I spoke to the commission on Tuesday. They said that they, they there might in future be a carbon removal specific call for proposals from the innovation fund, which would be amazing. But the major drivers in Europe are not going to be incentives, are going to be com compliance. So we got DTS, we got the Green Claims Directive, which will come into force, which will essentially <clears throat> prevent companies from making carbon neutral claims for their products uh, without really being able to back it up, which could be a huge boost for voluntary carbon market CDR. Right. Um, but that's where I would put more of the focus in Europe are those regulations. Got it. Okay. Um, just turning a little bit to the country angle. Um, so someone asked, when a, when a country wants to actually start researching some of the CDR application that are a bit more open, like so ocean-based things, enhanced rock weathering, um, to what degree do they need support or permission from any other countries? And sort of how does it how does it work as we think about developing some of those more open system uh, CDR things that have scale potential? Again, getting to the edge of my expertise, um, especially on oceans, I actually don't know how that would work <clears throat> right now in Europe. I think there's there's definitely regulation on a national level, but I'm not as plugged into oceans in Europe. And mm -hmm. um, I know, for example, for biochar, there's regulation about what type of biochar you can apply on lands, right? Um, like if, for, if you, for example, if you make biochar from sewage sludge, in certain countries, you might not be allowed to put it on lands. <laughs> so for agriculture, um, but you might be allowed to put it into concrete. So I know that those legislations exist, but again, I'm not an expert on it. Okay, got it. Um, just on some of the specific countries. Um, so someone wanted to ask a bit about Portugal. So they said, um, should we be differentiating policy according to the method of CDR? So the 9010 mm -hmm. that you mentioned for Portugal is based on Lulu CF alone. And that's kind of just maintaining the carbon sink that they have. So should we be treating that as like an ambitious CDR policy? Or how do we, I guess, account for those distinctions? It's a fair point. <laughs> and um, so my personal opinion is that... Um, if we can achieve the targets with Lulu CF, that's great. But everything I've seen is that beyond the national level, that's not possible. Like there's a limit to Lulu CF, um, and that limit is actually fairly low if you look at the global scale. So we do need other CDR to hit uh, the 10 gigatons plus that we need according to the IPCC. So I think it's a fair point. Um, but on a national level, I would, for me, the important thing is that the countries achieve their targets and that they're not, uh, that they're set ambitiously enough. Um, what my biggest concern would be um, if the monitoring uh, of, and if those 10% are actually achieved, right? Um, because the monitoring can be potentially a bit harder with Lulu CF than some of the CDR methodologies, but I wouldn't preset how they need to be achieved. Right. Okay. And then what about, you mentioned Finland. Um, can you just briefly explain what the difference in the accounting there is and what should people watch out for if they're trying to see if a country is following best practices on the accounting? Uh, I, I don't know. It was pointed out to me literally a few days ago. Um, I haven't had the time to look into it yet. So it's definitely, that's one of the things that's on my to-do list is to look at their, into their accounting much more because I just saw the 2035 target. I thought, wow, amazing, really ambitious, uh, very inspiring. And then somebody was like, yeah, but... Um, so if anyone has information, feel free to drop it in the chat uh, or point us in the right direction. Otherwise, yeah, it's definitely something I will probably be writing more about in the future. Great. Um, okay. And then the last one on the sort of country front, uh, someone was curious about Eastern Europe. Are there any individual countries in that area that are more likely to flip up towards, you know, the average rating or even above that in the next coming years? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they... It's it's and I sh I sh shouldn't have generalized too much, right? But obviously, like there was a trend if you just look at um the map and where they currently stand. <clears throat> but there are some countries, for example, if I think about uh, in the Baltics, if I think about Latvia, for example, um, if I think about uh, even Poland um, and their potential, there's some really interesting CDR companies in Poland as well. <clears throat> we can definitely see movement there, and it's almost I see it come going in two ways. Sometimes policymakers lead the way. Sometimes industries kind of emerge, CDR companies emerge that influence policymakers. Um, and I think in some of these countries, the latter approach might be more effective. Um, for example, there's a great, I forgot the name right now, but I can dig it up. There's a great EAW company in Poland and <clears throat> that's fantastic. And I'm sure 
that that company is going to do a lot of advocacy work on that front. Another a good example for this is Stiesdal, which is a company that uh, builds a biogeocarbon removal manufacturing equipment in Denmark. They've done a tremendous job um, educating the government. And I think it's not a coincidence that there's a biogeo carbon removal target in Denmark now, right? And really ambitious carbon removal targets in general. So um, I would really encourage kind of the companies that are emerging in those countries to do some of the work before the policymakers, because otherwise uh, it might take longer. Perfect. And then just the last couple of questions looking forward. Um, do you think there's any more any hope of moving kind of beyond net zero and transitioning to sort of real zero, which is, you know, thinking about historical emissions and factoring in that in and removing that? Um, or is that kind of way too far off in the future? Super inspiring uh, question. And actually for people involved, shout out this Saturday is the fifth annual climate restoration forum. So it's a very timely question. I'll be speaking at that as well. <laughs> and I've been very passionate about the concept of climate restoration because I think it's it's inspiring, right? Um, it's a bit utopian at times, it feels, but it's inspiring to think that we could actually get there. And um, I saw, and uh, I'm going to, it's one thing, I think I saw Denmark. Um, they actually passed a 110% uh, objective for 2050 or even 2040. I need to look into it. Um, and I'm going to write about that because I think it's the first country to my knowledge in the world that has set a ne negative objective. And um, I find that super inspiring. And I hope that more countries are going to do that. And once some of the bigger countries are going to do that, maybe even at EU level, although I doubt it, but imagine Germany or France starts making it clear that they're going to go beyond net zero. That could start a trend where maybe wealthy countries that hopefully can afford to by 2050 are not going to be net zero, but net negative. Um, so I, I see the first signs and it's 2023. So hopefully we're actually going to have a lot of countries trying to work towards climate restoration. Yeah, really exciting to hear that. Um, just to finish us out, one last thing. So for everyone here listening who cares about this stuff, um, what's the best thing that we all can do to help sort of push forward policymakers actually understanding this stuff, advocating for, you know, method neutral and criteria based policy as opposed to picking winners of Bex and Dax all the time? Um, how do we kind of influence those things from where all of us are standing today? So what I love about Europe, it's <laughs> there's an open process for input. Anyone, any individual, even as an individual, not even a company, can input. I don't know if somebody's already shared the 2040 goal uh, setting um, in the chat, <clears throat> but that's really easy to find. And they use statistics for a lot of these things. So if the 76 people who are on this call now submit, uh, in, it doesn't take long, it takes 15 minutes, uh, submit their multiple choice kind of, we should all have a CD, an ambitious CDR target by 2040, that heavily skews the statistics of that call and the commission will reflect that in their proposal. So if you do one thing, submit your 2040 uh, input, um, it's multiple choice, it's really easy and quick to do. Um, and I think really, really helpful for the CDR industry to speak up. If you have more time, plug for you guys, get involved with Open Air Coalition, right? Like <laughs> you've got chapters in some of the key countries now. Um, and those chapters can do a lot of good work in educating policymakers. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the low effort and the medium to higher effort way to, um, to get involved. Perfect. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for. Um, Sub, do you have any last thoughts uh, before we let you go? No, I hope this was uh, informative to people. It's a complex beast, Europe, um, but I hope that you can all take away some specific things that are relevant and especially some actions that you can take away. Great. Thanks, Seb. Um, just before we go, a uh, quick uh, update on some things that will be coming from open air in the next few weeks. Chris may or may not be able to put up a slide, but I will do my best to remember. So do check out the Climate Restoration Forum. Uh, like. Seb mentioned, um, check out the sort of webinars on Germany and Spain that Chris put up. There's a Luxembourg event uh, next Thursday, I believe. And then we are also, uh, we'll have a, a instance of uh, this is CDR next Tuesday on the 9th. And well, perfect, excellent timing. Um, and we'll be hosting Nikki Batchelor from XPRIZE to give us an update on what's going on there. Um, she's great. Please join us uh, in five days time for that. Um, and then if you go on Eventbrite, you'll be able to see many more. This is CDR uh, webinars that we've lined up over the next several weeks. So please check those out and register. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us.
I will thank leave, you everyone I'll leave the chat open for a couple more minutes because I know Chris has put lots of good links in there so <sighs> please feel free to copy those over and then um so we'll see you at the next one thank you and yeah thank you Chris for doing that I'm just seeing it now and it's amazing like life by sharing all these links is so valuable uh amazing I I will also, for those of you who don't want to, I'll share the text actually for the chat uh, with the email that I send out with the video link. So you don't have to go and scramble to copy all of those. They'll they'll be included in the email I send out tomorrow to all registrants. Thank you, folks. Really awesome. Even better. Thanks, everyone.